Well, what's up, everybody? Merry Christmas and welcome to Second Chance. Whether you're um, at home watching, whether you're in a car, hope you're in your car, you're listening and not watching um, because you should be driving. But anyway, Merry Christmas. Super excited that you're here for our Christmas message. Next week, we're going to start a brand new series called Any Given Sunday. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hope everybody gets lots of presents, gets to see all the family members this week. And yeah, that's it. We're going to dive right in. Everybody here, everybody watching, no matter where you're watching from, no matter who you are, we've all faced challenges in life. And when I say challenges, I'm not talking about anything. Don't, don't think big and super spiritual here. I'm talking about basic challenges. Like, for, let's be honest. Let's just be honest. People in the room, you got, you got to participate. How many of you have ever stood in front of your closet and could not figure out what to wear. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Even the guys. Even the guys. Yeah, me too. Because sometimes it's, it's like you got the same choices, right, for the most part, and you stand. And another question, participating here, how many of you ever put on an outfit, took it off, and put on another outfit? Raise your hand. Yeah, see, now, some of the guys aren't raising their hand, but I know you have. I, I, every, everybody's done it. You change like one or two or three times, and you wind up coming back because it's a challenge, right? It's the same clothes. You look at the same clothes every single time, and you can't figure out what to wear. All of us have faced, faced that challenge. Or when you go to a restaurant, how many of you ever gone to a restaurant, sat down, they give you the menu, and you cannot figure out what you want to eat? Raise your hand, especially Carly. Carly, raise both hands, because Carly <laughs> never knows. You go to the same restaurant every week, and she never knows. Um, but I remember my first time at the Cheesecake Factory, I was like, good God. They, like, I know how to solve world hunger. Send them all to the Cheesecake Factory, because that's where all the food in the world is, Right. We, fa we look at the menu, we've got all these options, and we can't figure out what to do. Well, that should help you kind of relate to me a little bit today, because preaching a Christmas mes message, super challenging. Let me tell you why. We don't have, as pastors, we don't have a lot of options. For 2,000 years, the Christmas story has not changed. There is not going to be a plot twist. We're not going to find out this year that Jesus was actually born in Belton and not Bethlehem, right? We're not going to find out um, that, that something happened. We've got the same story to tell every single year. And there's four accounts of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Mark and John don't even say anything about the Christmas story. Only Matthew and Luke talk about it. And there's some characters involved, but it's the same characters every year. There's some people involved, but there's some same people. And so one year, I remember I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to preach a Christmas message this year. I'm going to preach something that I think will connect with people. And that's where I learned, you, you don't screw with Christmas. You don't mess around. When people come to church on Christmas, they want to hear something about nine pounds, seven ounce, baby Jesus born in the... They, they want to hear about Jesus and the Christmas and the wise men and the, all that stuff. So today, we're going to talk about a group of people in the Christmas story that they've always been there, but, but I don't know that I've ever preached a message just on this particular group of people. And I want us to take a look at this group of people and see what we all have in common with them and, and maybe how that can work out in our lives. I want to talk about today, I want to talk about the shepherds. The shepherds. Now, they, they are always in the story, but they're never featured in the story, right? I remember being a shepherd <laughs> in a church play one time, um, and I wore my dad's bathrobe, and my mom literally put a towel around my head and tied a bandana. I was like the redneck shepherd, um, and I just kind of stood there. I didn't even have any lines, and everybody told me I did a good job. But the Bible says, in fact, Luke, Luke who writes the Christmas story, Luke said in, Luke said in um, chapter 2, verse 8, and there were shepherds, so that means more than one, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. Now, this is huge, and it's going to circle back in the story, but I want to explain this for just a second. Keeping up watch over their flocks at night. Notice it does not say there were shepherds keeping watch over their flock. There was not flo one flock. There were many flocks. For years and years and years, I imagined this scene being like seven or eight guys. You got Frank and Bill and Bob and Tim, and they're all hanging out. And they've got all these sheep, and all these guys take care of all these sheep. But after going to Israel several times and just seeing how shepherds, like, roll over there, you got one shepherd that would take care of several sheep, and another shepherd take care of several sheep. And so these were shepherds that might have been close in proximity, but they weren't together. It was one shepherd taking care of these sheep, one shepherd taking care of these sheep, 
One shepherd taking care of these sheep. They weren't hanging out together. They were in, in the same proximity, which is going to kind of play into the story in a little while. Now, three things I want to point out about the shepherds before, before we go further into the story. Three words that identify the shepherds that I think if we were all honest, we could identify with as well. The first word, if you're taking notes, is messy. Shepherds were messy. In order to be a shepherd 2,000 years ago in Israel society, you had you, being a shepherd was considered unclean. If you were unclean, you could not go to the temple, you could not have your sins prayed for, you could not be forgiven. So it was an unclean profession. In other words, it was messy. Now, how many of us have ever made a mess? You ever made a mess? I've made a mess. I was thinking about this the other day. I was in my apartment one morning. Um, and I wanted to make some coffee because it's best for the world if I have coffee before I communicate in any way. And so I turned the coffee thing on, and I'm over here doing it, and I, it literally sounded, I heard, I hear this water drip, and I'm like, is, is somebody peeing in my apartment? Like, that's what it sounded like. And I turned around, and I had forgotten to put the coffee pot thing under the coffee, and my floor was just full of coffee. I wanted to get mad at somebody, but I could, I made the mess, Right. We've, and we've all done that. We all made a mess or we've all felt like a mess. For example, if I wear something white, if I wear a white shirt, I'm not wearing white pants. I tried that in the 80s and it just didn't work. Some of y'all remember Coca-Cola jeans? If, if not, it was a thing for two minutes. But if I wear a white shirt, I'm gonna, if there's something to spill, I'm going to spill it. Coffee, um, barbecue sauce, ketchup, I'm going to get it on me. And then, and then if you've ever worn white and you got something on you, you're self-conscious about it for the rest of the day. And you'll tell people, hey, just don't pay no attention to this ketchup stain. And then that's all they can stare at, right? <laughs> we've all made a mess. We all feel like a mess. We've, we've all done that. Well, the shepherds in this story, they felt messy. But here's the thing about the shepherds. We don't know why they were shepherds. Maybe it was a personal choice. Maybe they said, you know what? Um, I know a shepherd is unclean. I know um, I can't go to the temple. I know I can't be connected with God, but I'm going to make some money. And that's how I'm going to make my money. And they chose to be a shepherd. Or maybe they were shepherd because of life circumstances. We have no idea why they were shepherd. But here's the thing I know about those of us that feel a little messy. Whether we made a mess or whether we are a mess or whether it's a combination of both, when you, when you see a messy person or when you look at a messy person, a lot of times we don't know why they're messy. We don't know what circumstances happened to them. We don't know what personal choices they had to make in, in, that, in that moment. So, so when I'm talking about the shepherds being messy, all of us in some way can connect to these guys because all of us have done things that are messy or make us feel messy. The second thing about the shepherds that I want to point out is the shepherds were lonely. The shepherds were lonely because, once again, you got this guy taking care of this group of sheep. You got this guy taking care of this group of sheep. You got this guy taking care of this group of sheep. And while they're in the same proximity, they're all alone. And everybody knows what it's like. To, do you know you can be in a crowded room and be the loneliest person in the world? Um, not too long ago, I was invited to preach at a church and I went, and it was awesome. It was a charismatic church, and charismatic churches are a lot of fun to preach in because you can say anything, and they just, amen. People were standing up. Tambourines were flying. I mean, we, we had a phenomenal worship service. I never will forget this. So I preach, and I preach, and I preach, and I preach. I'm done preaching, and, um, and we had a second service. So I, so I was getting ready for the second service, and after the, so after the first service, this guy comes up to me, and he goes, hey, you need to come with me. Now, he had a gun and a taser. So I figured, hey, I'm not armed, so I'm going to go with this guy. He leads me out of the building, took me to another building, walked me to the back of that building, put me in a room, shut the door, and said, we'll come get you in a little while. I sat there for 45 minutes. I had no idea. They had snacks in the room, but I had a friend call me. She said, hey, how are you doing? I said, I think I'm in timeout. Like, I don't, I don't know what just happened because I just went from, this is the most amazing thing in the world to, I, they might not ever find my body. I went, I experienced loneliness that fast. Now, here's what I know about our society. I was just reading about this this week. Loneliness is becoming an epidemic. 
There are more people in this world. And listen, I'm not going to go off on don't uh, like get off your device or stuff. I, I'm not going to, I'm just saying we're more connected, but more lonely than ever. And you know why? You know why we're lonely? The only time we don't feel lonely is when we're around people that really know who we are. And we're so scared for people to really know who we are because we're scared to death. If they knew who we were, they wouldn't want to be around us. And that makes us feel lonely. Now, I'm just saying, if you're messy, it often leads to us feeling lonely because we don't want people to know how messy we really are. Which leads to the third thing about the shepherds. They were uncertain. Now, all of us, all of us have experienced uncertainty in life. In fact, one of the most uncertain times in my life took place in a shepherd's field in Bethlehem. I, was, I, went, to, I went to Israel to do a video shoot. I was in a shepherd's field in Bethlehem at night. And when I tell you there was nothing, no, no civilization around us, there was nothing around us. And so we had this section where we, had, we, we rented some lights. We had lights brought in. But standing there, you could hear coyotes and hyenas all around, all around. Now, the problem, it was, it was a great, like, setting to shoot a video. But when you get in that particular situation and you have to pee, it's a problem because there are no porta potties. There are no bathrooms. And I walked up to my guide and I was like, I was like, hey, um, Tony, we called him Tony cause we couldn't pronounce his name. I was like, Hey Tony, I said, I, um, I got to pee. And he was like, uh, this is a problem. I was like, I know that's why I came to you because you're the God and I'm, you're supposed to be able to help me. I said, can I go out just out right in there and just pee? And he looked at me, he said, if you walk outside of the light, I cannot guarantee your safety. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to pee in the light. So I told everybody, I was like, hey, y'all close your eyes, turn around, whatever you got to do, because if I'm in the light, it's certain. But if I step out of the light, it's uncertain. And I'm not going to go get eaten by a hyena while I'm trying to take a pee. Now, the problem, the, the whole point of this is all of us have experienced that type of uncertainty. Like we, we are in this zone, but if we step over here, we're uncertain. Now, let me, let me tell you how messed up the religious system was in this day. And let me tell you how uncertain the shepherds were. Now, don't miss this. The shepherds in Bethlehem kept the sheep that were used in the temple for the sacrifices for the sins of people. So the shepherds could take care of the sheep that were used for sacrifice, but they could not have those sheep sacrificed for their sins. And so it threw them into a little bit of uncertainty because, hey, we're out here taking care of the sheep that are used for sacrifice. Maybe that counts for something, and we can't go to the temple and have our sins prayed for or forgiven for, but we're out here doing something good for the king. And so they're spiritually confused. And what I've discovered in, in the past year or two and talking with lots and lots of people is when it comes to spirituality, in a relationship with Jesus, there's a lot of uncertainty, especially if, just answer this question, and you don't have to answer it out loud, just answer it for yourself. Has there ever been a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are right now? Because if the answer is yes, it leads to uncertainty. Where, where do I stand with God? How does he view me? How does he see me? What, where do I stand with him? The shepherds were uncertain. Now, out of all these words, out of all these words, messy, lonely, uncertain, and this word right here that's going to work its way into the language, peace, pick which word, and don't tell anybody, you don't have to write this down, or you don't have to raise your hand or blurt it out or anything. Just pick which word you identify with the most. I'm, going to tell, I'm not going to tell you what my word is, I'm going to tell you what my word is not on this list. The, the word that I don't identify with the most is peace. 
I don't experience peace driving down the road, especially in Anderson on Clemson Boulevard. I don't experience peace when I'm in Publix and somebody has 10 or more items in front of me and I got less than 10. I don't experience peace. Like, like all of us know what it's like to have our peace interrupted. And so with that in mind, with messy, lonely, uncertain people, I want us to continue in the Christmas story. This is what, this is what Luke said. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the shepherds. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, let me pause real quick. There's a reason they were terrified. They were taught that God gets bad people and loves good people. And so they were terrified because they thought that God was going to get them. That's what they've been taught all their lives. So if you're out in the middle of a field and all of a sudden here come the angels and here comes the light, you're thinking this is the wrath, this is the judgment of God, which is what I've discovered. The reason a lot of people don't go to church is because they already feel bad enough without going to church. And so they're scared to death like the wrath of God is going to fall. And so these guys are terrified. And the angel speaks up, and I love this, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you, now look, this right here, good news. I love that. I love the fact that the angel said, I bring you good news. I, I love the fact that the angel did not say, I bring you good advice. And I think one of the things that Christianity should spend way more time focusing on is good news rather than good advice. Good advice is don't listen to this music, don't go to these movies, don't vote for this person, don't vote for this party. And you know what? I've discovered that the world is not interested in our good advice. But good news is unconditional love. Good news is amazing grace. Good news is nothing is impossible. Good news is the tomb is empty. And I think if we spent way more time focusing on good news rather than good advice, that the gospel would advance much further in the world. It's a great spot for somebody to say amen. All right, here we go. I bring you good news that will cause great joy, not great shame, not great guilt, which, come on, as Christians, we're known for that, aren't we? <laughs> Creating shame and guilt. I was literally at a church. Well, it wasn't a church service. It was an evangelical service one time. And the altar call was going so bad. When I say, like, nobody was responding. Like, the message was average. I was there with some friends. Nobody was responding. And the guy on stage literally said, if you have sinned this week, you should be at the altar. I'm like, I'm not going. I am not, I sinned this week and I'm not going, because it was just guilt and just manipulation. I was like, I'm, we're not doing that. Um, lost my place, ADD. Great joy for all the people. There we are. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Don't miss this. God chose to announce the birth of his son to messy lonely, uncertain people that were in the middle of nowhere doing something that the world considered to be unclean. Isn't that just like God? That he didn't announce the birth at the temple. He announced it to the shepherds. It, verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, let me pause real quick and just say that Luke actually mentions the word manger three times in the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 2, if you read through Luke chapter 2, you'll see the, the um, word manger listed three times. Here's the deal. We look at mangers today in little Christmas plays, and they're cute and they're nice. Mangers were messy. Ma mangers were the animals fed out. They, they would eat out of mangers. Would you take your brand new baby today and put it in your dog bowl? No, because it's messy, right? Your dog ate out of that thing. And I know your dog is awesome, but he's still messy. She's still messy, all right? Animals would eat out of the manger, but don't miss this. The reason I believe that the baby was in the manger and, and the angels kept telling this to the shepherds is because the angel wanted the shepherds to know that the Messiah could identify with their mess. And not only could he identify with their mess, he ultimately came to take away their mess. It, it goes on to say this. 
Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the, in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor, the Greek word right here for favor is charis, which also means grace, rest. Now, here's the deal. In reading this, I thought, if there's peace on earth, where's my peace? Have you ever felt that? Because all of us know what it's like to be absent of peace. Like when you're riding down the road and you see the blue lights in your mirror, peace is gone. When you get the credit card bill in the mail, peace is gone. When you step on the scale after eating Christmas goodies, peace <laughs> is, is gone. And so are some of those outfits you got, right? Like all of us know what it's like to experience times where peace is absent in our life, especially in our spiritual lives. Because we, we know people that do it better than us, right? We know people that seem to have it together. Notice I said seem, because you know what I've discovered in 47 years of life? This has nothing to do with ministry nobody has their stuff together. And the more put together they look, the more they're probably pretending. Just, and that's just something to file away for another time. That was, that was free. I won't even charge for that. The angel said, peace on those whom his grace rest. And I'm like, if, if I've received his grace, then where is my peace? We'll get to that in a minute. When the angels had left them and gone into, the, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, so don't miss this, lonely people out in the middle of nowhere hear about the Messiah. Jesus brings lonely people together. The shepherds who had their individual flocks all of a sudden come together around the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't just die on the cross to save us. He died on the cross so we could come together and actually experience peace with one another as well as him. Now, here, here, here we, this is so cool. They said to one another, let's go. In other words, this is going to be a journey for us to go on together. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So lonely, messy, uncertain people all of a sudden hear about Jesus and they start on a journey to see the Messiah. Great picture of what the church is supposed to look like. Not perfect people, but just some messy, lonely, uncertain people showing up to hear about this man named Jesus. The Bible goes on to say this. It's so cool. Luke tells us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. There it is again. Now, it, some of you are like, where's the third time? It happened earlier in the story. You'll have to go back and you can fact check me. And if I'm wrong, just I'm sure somebody will let me know. Um, who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. You know why they were amazed? Because it was shepherds saying this to them. It wasn't the priest, it wasn't the prophet, it was the shepherds that were, were telling them the good news. Now, the, Luke closes the story out by saying, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned. So, they, they, were, they, they went and saw Jesus, and they stepped back into shepherding. They didn't go from shepherd to, like, prophet. They, they go back to shepherding. It's a real unique, real unique part of the story that Luke shares with us. The shepherds returned, but they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard. Notice the plurality here. They had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So, so with all of this, with all of this in mind, I want to make two, two main points before we close out the message today when it comes to peace. And here it is. And we see this in the story of the shepherds. Peace 
is a process that begins with the person of Jesus. Peace is a process that begins with the purpose, with the, with the person of Jesus. The shepherds, the shepherds were promised peace on earth. The shepherds would go and see Jesus. They celebrate this event. It's super exciting. But then they step back into shepherding. That's not, that doesn't seem right, right? Aren't we used to the stories in the church where I was a shepherd and I met Jesus and then I became the high priest? Like, that's the stories that we're used to, okay? I was a crack-smoking axe murderer and I met Jesus and now I'm an evangelist. Like, that's the story that we're used to. But all of a sudden, we see the shepherds and they're messy and they're isolated and they're lonely and they're uncertain and they go see Jesus and their uncertainty's gone, but they step back into their circumstances. You see, a lot of people will tell you, if you'll just pray to receive Jesus, he changes everything. And that's true. True and not true. He changes everything in, internally. Like um, he changes our eternal destination. He changes our heart. He gives us all his right. He takes all our wrong. There are some changes that are involved. But if you pray to receive Jesus, you might still wrestle with an addiction. You might still wrestle with a mental illness. You might still wrestle through some uncertain situations. Can he heal people immediately? Yes, and he does. I've seen it. But more often than not, peace is a process that begins with the person of Jesus. I would say that we can't have true peace apart from Jesus. So if you're a Christian and sometimes you wrestle with why is my life like this or it seems like my... I'm, listen, listen, listen. He's working us through a process. And in his time, in his time, not our time, in his time, he makes everything as it should be. You don't like where you are right now? I understand. I would just say you're probably in the middle of a process. The second thing, the second thing that I would like to share is grace, grace, peace on earth, to whom his favor rests. Grace is not something we achieve. It's something we receive. The reason a lot of people don't experience peace on earth is because we're so uncertain as to whether or not we've done enough to get God's approval. In other words, have I gone to church enough? Have I done more good deeds? I remember having a conversation with a young lady one time, and I asked her, um, it was super interesting. I said, how do you think you get to heaven? She said, well, my pastor told me, um, which I don't know who this person's pastor was, um, or I ought to track them down and hurt them because they didn't tell the truth. So my pastor told me when I get to heaven, they're going to burn my good deeds and burn my bad deeds. And if the ash pile from my bad deeds is bigger than my good deeds, I go to hell. But if the ash pile from my good deeds are bigger than my bad deeds, I go to heaven. Yeah, I heard both of y'all say something. I said the same thing. Some of y'all are like, I didn't hear it. It's good. We're Second Chance Church. Um, it's, yeah, I literally, well, I laughed. I did. I laughed out loud, and she didn't laugh. I was like, are you serious? She's like, yeah. She said, that's why I try to just be good. She said, because I know I'm bad, but I feel like if I do two good deeds to every one bad deed, I'm going to be okay. And that's where I had to talk to her about the concept of grace. That, that, let me ask you this question. Let me ask this question. What did the shepherds do in order to receive God's grace? Nothing. Nothing. God appeared to them when they were messy, lonely, and uncertain, and announced the gospel to them. And all they had to do was receive it. That's it. And if that's what he did 2,000 years ago for the shepherds, that's what he'll do for you because that's what he did for me. So at the end of the day, peace is a process that begins with the person of Jesus, but that process doesn't begin until we stop trying to achieve God's grace and actually receive his grace. With that in mind, let's pray. Father, I want to pray right now for everyone who is watching, listening. 
God, who might be going through a time where, God, they would not pick peace as the word that describes them the most. Jesus, I pray that in the story of the shepherds, they would be reminded that they're not alone, that you see exactly where they are, and you are with them. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're watching today or listening, and you've never prayed. You've never received God's grace. You've never received Jesus. You've always thought you could work and be real, just a super good person. And the shepherds could have never worked their way out of shepherding, but all they, they did receive God's grace. And maybe you're like the shepherds today. You realize you've worked hard or you've tried to do some good stuff, or maybe you feel messy, or maybe you feel spiritually lonely or isolated. And the good news is what Jesus did for the shepherds. He wants to do for you today. All you've got to do in order to become a Christian is just simply say, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. I want to receive your grace. So if that's what you want to do, and by the way, Christmas 2018 would be the best time in your life to receive Jesus into your life. If you want to receive Jesus into your life today, then right where you are right now, I want you just to pray in your heart. Say, Jesus Christ, right now, I receive your grace. I receive your unconditional love. I receive you into my life. Come in and take over. I give everything to you. You are my Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed to receive Christ today and you're on um, church online, if you'll just do the hand raise emoji because we want to celebrate with you and follow up with you, do anything we can to help and serve you. If you're on Facebook, if you'll just do the hand raise emoji, we would love to know that you prayed to receive Christ today. If you'll do that, we want to celebrate that with you this Christmas. Um, and we're super excited. Couple of now, and, and those hand raises are huge. We keep track of that because we so far we've seen like 311 people receive Christ at Second Chance since we got started, and we know there's more coming. Um, I want to answer a question real quick because a lot of you are, are probably asking. I didn't even, I'll look at the Facebook comments yesterday. Where do you get that shirt? Um, I'll tell you in a few weeks. How about that? Right now, we just got a couple of them, but I'll tell you in a few weeks. It, it is a cool shirt, I know. Thank you very much. Hey, um. We do have a building update. Don't want anybody to get that. We've got a building update. We had to move the date that we're going to move into the building. Not by much, not by much, but the building date now is January the 27th, 2019. We pushed it back two weeks. And here's why, just to kind of let everybody know. Um, we are having, we're just having a few issues with a fire alarm and we've got to get this fire alarm because it's got to be just right. Cause if it's not just right, then we don't want the place to catch on fire and all of us just burn alive. That's people have asked me before, what's your greatest fear burning alive. So because of that, we've moved the, the date back Sunday, January 27th. Now I know some of you are like, Oh my gosh, I was planning on the 13th. Okay. Well, listen, I told you not to do that. I told you don't make big plans. That means it's not going to be that. I, I, I told you not to do it. I told you. So you need to learn how to listen to me. Now, this is the date right here. We're going to move in. Sunday, January 27, 2019. Two services, 915, 1115. We just had to push it back a couple weeks just so we can get the fire alarm situated. Because, listen, we, we got to get a CO. It's called a certificate of occupancy. If we go in there without one, it's illegal and we all get arrested, which would make an amazing story, but that's not, well, there'll probably be somebody get arrested at second chance one day. Anyway, that's where, that's when we're going to start <laughs> the, um, that's where we'll be in the building and super excited about that. Also wanted to say, um, we've had a few questions about year-end giving. The, the, the answer to the question, we've had people ask, hey, what do I need to do about my year-end giving? If you're going to mail something to Second Chance, as long as it's postmarked by um, before January 1st, 2019, it'll count on 2018. Um, for those of you that are giving to Second Chance, thank you so much. For those of you that might want to get started, you can give online at mysecondchancechurch.com. There's a give button in the right-hand side, or you can mail a check to Second Chance Church, 2000, or 210 South Main Street, Anderson, South Carolina, 29624. And, and be, because you guys give, we've been able, listen, we're going into this building debt-free because of the generosity of some amazing, amazing people. So thank you very much. 
I hope you have a great Christmas, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.